treating the shoulder. As a practitioner, what are you expecting? You're expecting a patient that comes in restricted with very little range of motion. Are you expecting in one treatment to be able to get them up to here? Or maybe to get them all the way up to that full range of motion? Or is that unreasonable? What are we expecting? Maybe the patient's got a rotator cuff tear and we aren't going to be able to get any kind of range and we need to be referring them off for treatment. So it can be a challenge to work out what's going on for the patient. There's so many moving parts. I mean, look at all these muscles to start with and they all need to be working together. The pecs, the deltoid, biceps, and of course through the back here, all the way through, trapezius, rhomboid, etc., etc., triceps. If those are not balanced and working together, then you are not gonna get a functioning shoulder and arm. Now we take off that layer and go a little bit deeper and you've obviously got the joint as well. And there's issues with the joint then you're going to have issues with the shoulder. So what is happening deep in this socket? What is happening with the position of the humerus in the glenoid socket? How is the clavicle affecting this? What about all the ribs? So there's a whole bunch of stuff here, even before we start talking about scapular stabilization, influence of the latissimus muscle coming up the back there. So a lot of stuff going on. So I get why this challenges practitioners, but shoulders can be so much fun to work with. And if you are able to identify which of the ones you need to refer off because you think you've got the rotator cuff, and then which of the ones you can actually get in and work on, then you can get some great changes. And I'll show you a simple example here. Look at this shoulder motion here. This is showing shoulder abduction, obviously. And the muscle that we've got highlighted here is the coracobrachialis. Now, what we'll do here, if we just zoom in a little bit here, and we see that coracobrachialis, now, you can get in and work very easily on this coracobrachialis and obviously other muscles around there. Now, if that muscle contracts and the biceps contracts, then what is it going to do? Let's say the person has had the arm has been in an outstretched position like this and they fell on it. Boom. Well, you're going to get this protection. You're going to get obviously the influence of the joint, but you're also going to get the muscle contract to try to protect that area. And so what then happens is let's say we're back in that resting position this coracobrachialis is contract, then what it's going to do, it's going to drag this humerus up. It's going to drag this humerus upwards. And what you're going to see is that this humerus socket here starts to jam in, in the socket. Here. So this space here reduces. Now, obviously, we're talking about anatomy here, so we're not going to close all the way up here. You know, this is subtleties we're talking about here. We're going to talk about a movement of this humeral head into a position that's not optimal. And then what happens is that as this bone starts to move, as we start to move up into this abduction, what happens is that this part of the humerus here is it starts to jam and it, and it can't actually get in and work and move the way it wants to. Because we, if we zoom in and look at this humeral head, as we move the arm into abduction, the humeral head does not go up. I mean, it, it does relatively, you look at the whole body moving, the scapula moving, but what is happening is that as that arm bone comes up, the humerus goes up, then what's happening is this humerus actually needs to shift a little bit. And when we drag it all the way up into that position, in terms of the actual position in relation to the socket, it's actually come downwards. So there's this lever motion going on. Now what happens is if that humeral head is a little bit further up, then you can't do that. It can't do that beautiful motion in that socket. It can't get that motion. Let's see if we can get a good view in here. Yeah, look at that. Look at that roll through there. Let's see if we can get it even better. Oh, better is the enemy of good. Here we go. This is our one we want. So watch this here. As this, Watch the humeral head, not the arm. So it's sliding, 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 sliding all the way through that. Now, if that muscle here, the coracobrachialis, is contracted, then as it tries to do that, it can't get that smoothness. And instead, it jams in and you get this clunkiness and the person and the person reports this inability to move the arm up or they report a poor quality in terms of that motion. Because obviously it's not just about this muscle. You think about that muscle contracting, that and then pulling the humeral head out of position, then what's gonna happen here with the pec muscle? That's gonna be influenced. We come around the back, we look at the latissimus muscle, we look about all the other muscles here that are acting in conjunction, working together, and you get this clunkiness of this movement. So we either get this restriction in motion where we can't come all the way up, or we can get the full 
well, not full range, good range, but it just feels like it jams. It feels like it drags. And the patient reports that this whole area just doesn't feel right. So that's the coracobrachialis. Now, what happens if we add in the bicep here? Well, the same thing can happen with this bicep. It can influence what is happening at this joint. And sometimes you see these patients that kind of walk around with that little internal rotation and this elbow is slightly flexed because this is contracted. It's influencing the elbow joint, but it also influences what goes on all the way through that socket there. And particularly also obviously in that motion of that shoulder. And the great thing about shoulders is that you will find a lot of patients coming in with shoulder dysfunction where if you work on these bicep muscles and if you work on the coracobrachialis and you do that with, you just slide your hand into this gap here. So we will come in behind the patient here and you slide your hand in and work on those muscles. You can work on the triceps as well using inhibition. So we're not using a rocket science type of technique here. We're using gentle inhibition. I come in and I gently engage that muscle, a little bit of compression, and wait for it to melt a little bit. What I'll also do is use both my hands for the technique. So what I'll actually do is my one hand will come in here. So the fingers of my left hand, for example, will come in around the humerus here, and I'll be contacting the coracobrachialis. And we'll talk about how you contact that and what you'll contact that in a minute. But we contact through there, gentle inhibition, and then my right hand will take hold of their arm and I'll get induced a little bit of motion. So I'll move this back and forth, back and forth. As my fingers or my left hand are sliding in and engaging on that coracobrachialis, engaging on that bicep, whilst I'm getting a little bit of motion here. Now what I can do sometimes is actually bring this up even higher so we start to have a little bit of more motion through that, uh, more effectiveness in terms of the range and the stretch through that muscle that you're working on. So simple technique like this, not rocket science, but it almost is rocket science because it's such an effective technique. It allows you to normalize the coracobrachialis, normalize the biceps break, uh, breakout, and then what you'll actually find is you'll retest and you've had motion here. So the patient's got, ah, oh, he's getting pain at this kind of range. And suddenly, you bring them up to here and they're like, what? They just look at you like stunned and they, they will sing your praises to the roof. They're like, you gotta go and see this person, he's amazing. What have you done? You worked on these muscles. It wasn't particularly you know, difficult technique. What it was, it was knowing the areas to work on and knowing the areas which are gonna make you an effective change. And so working like shoulders like that can make huge difference for patients and huge difference for your practice because people love it and they see the visible change. Sometimes with the back pain, it's like you treat someone, they get relief. Sometimes you treat them, they don't get relief for three or four days, five days, they're like, oh, well, it wasn't really the osteopath, I saw it. it, it was gonna come good anyway. It's not like this with shoulders. They come in, they're like, oh, what's your problem? I can't move my arm more than here. You take them out, at the end of treatment, they can move it up to here. They see that, they are stunned and they love it. Now, of course, not all shoulder injuries will respond as quickly as that and you have to identify the ones that won't. How? By doing your orthopedic testing. Now, we will see orthopedic testing, people will bring the arm up into here and you test in this range. Well, that's pretty hard if they can't get it up to that range. So what do you do? Well, you take them into this kind of range. What can they do? This range here? Okay, well, you might do a little bit of testing. You might get them to push up against you. And if that's incredibly painful, then you're not gonna go any more than that. But that doesn't mean you can't work on this coracobrachialis you can't work on these muscles through this area here. Why? Because you're in this range anyway. Either the arm is still and you're working on it, or you're working with that little bit of moment, motion I showed you, and then we'll retest. And then we we'll go, okay, now we can get a bit further. Mm, interesting. Okay, you might not rotate a cuff test again because you don't want to aggravate them too much. You might then work a little bit more through here, work for the pecs, and see if you can get a bit more motion. Now, if you can come up to here, say here, Yes, we'll do a rotator cuff and we might get a better idea of what's happening because you might have these muscles contracting down. You might have the coracobrachialis in trouble and the other muscles in trouble and still have a rotator cuff tear. So please listen to it. Make sure you do your rotator cuff test. Make sure you are safe to treat. All that stuff I showed you is safe to treat. Why? Because you've got it in this range of motion here. You're not taking it up and stressing it into an area which is gonna damage it further. And if you have any doubts about them having a rotator cuff, you refer off. Why? Because within six weeks, that will start to fill in with scar tissue. 
because you want a referred off. It's going to take a few weeks to get a referral and get them to see an orthopedic person. So if they're going to get surgery, you want that surgery before it starts filling in with scar tissue. But notwithstanding, that doesn't mean you can't work with it in that range through that area there. Start to get change, a hmm, bit more slack. Now we can work on it a bit more, etc., etc. Now, of course, there's lots you can do in terms of the joints as well. I'm not going to go into this. I've got a whole course that talks about shoulders and treating shoulders, 50 videos long. So, you know, that's something that we can't cover just in one video. But I want to talk about those easy wins that we talked about, working on the muscles, also being safe, talk about these rotator cuff injuries and making sure we screen for those. And then I want to move on and talk about a third type of patient. And that's the type of patient that is long term. What I mean by that is not necessarily long term, you've got to treat them long term, but they've had this injury for a long time. And I'm actually seeing one later this afternoon is what inspired me to shoot this video because I've seen, seen a lot of these patients recently where they're like, look, I can get range up to here. Look, I can come up to here. And it just jams a bit up here. And they're just not particularly happy with the full end range. These are youngish people, you know, 40 or younger. And it's that end range doesn't feel good. Also, through this motion here, they've got the quantity, but the quality is just you know, it's not very happy for them. And what's going on with these patients is that it's not, it, yes, there's the involvement of the joint and the muscles we talked about, but there's also this huge other influence going on through the whole of this chest wall, which we're going to talk about now. If we talk about a patient that's been having a problem for a long period of time, then there's a lot of stuff that's going on. And for example, in the shoulder, if we just look at the shoulder here and we think about the influence here of the latissimus muscle. Now, if the shoulder has been affected, it's going to influence the latissimus dorsi, which is going to influence this low back via its connection to the sacrum. So you're going to get lots of different types of compensation. So that's part of working with people when we work in manual therapies is tracking down all of these different things. And so I can't go through all of chronic decompensation from a shoulder in this short video, but there's one aspect I want to bring to your attention, which you may not have been thinking about, which is really useful. Because when we think about injuries in terms of the shoulder, let's strip off some of these muscles here. And when we strip off these muscle layers and we come right down to this aspect here, what are we looking at? Well, we've got that lung underneath there. That rib cage is protecting, obviously, the lung. Now, what happens is if you have an injury, the influence on this lung can be quite influential. Think about an injury through the outstretched hand. So very commonly with shoulder injuries, what happens is the arm is stretched outwards. Now that might be because the patient falls and they grab onto something. And then what happens is as the body falls away, that arm gets extended out and we get a drag, a pull all the way through this chest wall. Now the opposite obviously can happen as well in terms of what we can have is the patient falls on that outstretched arm and you get a force up that arm which comes in through that glenohumeral joint is transmitted through the clavicle and the scapula to the rest of the body here and if you like that scapula tries to pull away a little bit from this rib cage and we have an influence through the rib cage now additionally what can happen is that once you fall on that outstretched arm well what happens is that Often then afterwards you get an impact through the actual chest wall itself. There's other variations of that where you can get a kind of shearing where the arm is closer to the body. There's a fall and the force kind of jams in. You can also get where the arm is actually just on the side there. And so the patient literally just falls on their arm on their side. They don't get a chance to get their arm out or they get their arm out just a little bit. But then the impact through the fall, through the weight there, actually ends up with that arm being jammed against the shoulder, jammed against the shoulder, and then what happens is that the weight, the force, transmits straight across through this side of the rib cage. Now that might be straight across, it might be from the front. So lots of different variations that can happen with that. Now the influence of those injuries obviously is on the shoulder in terms of the joint and the muscles. However, why over a very long period of time can these type of injuries be very stubborn? Well, one of the factors is that area there that we talked about, that respiratory system, the lung. And if we zoom in here, you can actually see very clearly there, well, not very clearly, but I'll point it out. So here we have one lobe of the lung. The lower, so this is the right-hand side. On the, left, on the left-hand side, we only have two lobes of the lung. So let's do the right, which is slightly more complex. 
So we have the lower lobe of the lung, we have the middle lobe of the lung, and then we have the upper lobe of the lung. Now, if we get an impact through this shoulder, went through the outstretched arm or through this rib cage, then what's going to happen is often what you can find is that there's this lung lobe shifts a little bit on the lobe below or equivalent of this lobe to the lower lobe. And what happens there then is that the body doesn't really like that because that's particularly inefficient where the lung is in this slightly, and I'm talking millimeters here, millimeters here. Otherwise, obviously you'd get a, a pneumothorax or you get some kind of a problem where the impact has been so much you've broken ribs and snapped ribs and, and caused major trauma. We're not talking about that there. We're talking about the patient that's had an injury of four many years ago, sometimes five, ten years ago, and they've got ongoing shoulder pain and they're not complaining about any particular respiratory issue or acute problem they need to go to the hospital for. But what's happened is the compensation through the bones, through the muscles, which we all know about in terms of manual health practitioners as osteopaths, I want to also point out is that you can get this decompensation through the lobes of the lung as well. And what happens then is the body is going to be resistant to you moving anything around because the, the scapula, the ribs, the muscles, all of that is trying to do its best, the best effort to express health and help out those lobes of the lung. And so what we want to do in that respect is when you are treating the shoulder, you have one I was going to say eye, but one kind of ear, one part of your attention on this lung field. So you start to feel, is there a force vector? Is there a tension? Is there a shift through one of these lobes of the lung? And if you focus on that area whilst you're doing the rest of your manual treatment, you often get a really good shift. Addition, you can do visceral work where you're working directly. You take your hands on one part of the lobe, the middle lobe, the lower lobe, whatever, and you start to see if there's a little bit of movement one way or the other and see where it wants to go. Don't necessarily think, I want it to come back into this anatomical position. Often it'll want to go more into a distortion to allow it to release the force in there, the force vector and the old kind of injury. And once you get a shift through that respiratory system, through the lung field, often you'll find then that the muscles and the bones start to respond a lot better. Now, often you'll still need to treat those muscles and bones because especially something that's been going on for so long, yes, you can have that influence through the lobes of the lung, but you still have all of these compensations and decompensations through the whole body. If something has been going on the shoulder for a long time, whoa, it's gonna affect, like we said, down to the lat muscle into the sacrum. It's gonna affect the SI joint, SI joint. It's gonna affect the whole pelvis. But equally, you're going to get changes through the trapezius, upper, lower, middle, and up into the neck as well. So all of these things need to be addressed. But the key is finding something that will allow you to shift these patients. Often these patients will be like, oh, it's been going on for ages. I just have to put up with it. I've seen a load of people. This can be one of the keys that gets you in and gets that change. So we've only discussed three types of patients. Rotator cuff tear patients patients that respond really quickly and those that are more chronic. Of course, there's lots of subsets within that and a lot more about treating the shoulder. We can only scratch the surface in this video. If you'd like a deeper dive and really want to get the grips with the technicalities of working with shoulders and getting really good at them, I can highly recommend the Kindred Academy course, Treating the Shoulder. It's one of a suite of courses that I've developed using clinic footage that have proved to be incredibly popular with 995 of your fellow practitioners having done one or more of these courses. This shoulder course is very extensive with 53 separate tutorials covering everything from obviously a deep look at examination through to orthopedics and referral, covering a lot of treatment techniques and then going on into rehab treatment. To check out the full syllabus for that course, go to the website www.kindredb.com or check out the playlist here on the YouTube channel called Courses. Or you can just drop me an email. My email details are up on that website, kindredb.com, and ask me anything you want in terms of details on that course. I hope this video was of use to you. There's a lot more videos like this on the YouTube channels, whether it's about treating adults or treating babies. So a lot more to explore.